This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board. Hope you've had a great week, and I hope your weekend is even even better. We're able to have some time with uh, family and friends, and of course you may be uh, working, some of you may be working even on the weekend, uh, because this is your uh, money time in certain parts of the country, and for those of you that aren't, but I hope you do enjoy that with your with your family. Uh, do take a few moments, if you would be so kind, as to subscribe to the channel. Make sure you ring the bell so you can be updated about new uh, entries. I publish about once a week. And then, of course, give us a five-star review. I thought I would spend a few minutes today uh, just talking about where you could find back issues or back, back episodes. I guess it's not a, pub, not a print publication, is it? If you come to my website, that's wildlifecontrolconsultant.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant.com. And at the header bar, you'll see a heading that says training. And if you scroll down, you'll see living the wildlife podcast shows. I know that wildlife isn't spelled properly because, well, that's a story uh, with, with Franklin in terms of how he named the show. But nevertheless, if you click that, you will get a list of the various shows that I've done since 2018 when I began to start my segment of the Pest Geek podcast. And so I have the titles here and you in along with their dates. It's done, so it's done in a chronological fashion. Uh, I try to keep it up to date. Sometimes I'm, I'm not always uh, getting on to it after I do it several weeks or if actually there was uh, several months I hadn't been updating it. But nevertheless, you may find that there's going to be information about topics that I've already dealt with in the past. I am... I try not to redo subjects that have been done already. Now, I'm not perfect about that. Uh, because we, as our podcast grows, some people aren't necessarily uh, going back and listening to my earlier stuff. And I think that's disappointing because I would rather not revisit things that I've covered before unless there's some new information that has occurred. Nevertheless, there you go. I publish about once a week and I've tried to list all of the various subjects. Now, will I create a page based on subjects? organize the material based on subjects? I suspect yes. I'm just not sure how I'm going to organize that material yet. And of course, I have to have the time to get that done. Now, I did want to point out one additional thing here, and that is I separate my interviews from my subjects. And so you want to be sure if you come to this particular page, you'll see at the top for a list of interviews, click interviews. So you have to click that to bring you to a different page because I've separated interviews from subject matter. And this is where I've done my interviews. Of course, if you're interested in being interviewed on the show, definitely reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant.com. That's uh, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I'd love to talk to you about the being on the show. It doesn't cost anything if uh, if it, in terms of if you have something that's going to be substantive for our audience, be happy to have you. Of course, if, I would love to get donations. Of course, to those of you that want to be sponsoring a show, uh, definitely reach out to me. I would love to talk to you. Of course, so interviews on this page. If you go back. For the shows, this is the shows. Obviously, I've done a lot more subject shows than I have done interviews. Part of that is because um, I just find a lot of people are very shy about being on a podcast, and it's been kind of, kind of weird actually. Uh, but nevertheless, um, that's kind of how that works. So I've done a lot of shows because uh, I haven't done enough searching for interviews. But by the same token, I have done, I've had asked, I think a fair percentage wise, a fair amount of people I've asked uh, who've, re who've rejected it and for no apparent 
for no reason that I've been able to actually determine. So if you have insights on that, definitely drop me a line at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com or maybe post it up on Facebook. Uh, join, our, join our group there. Well, let's move on from this and get on to the subject of that I wanted to talk about today, and that is, believe it or not, alligators. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about alligators here and about the euthanasia or humane dispatch of alligators. Now, those of you who have been following the show know that we I separate, I distinguish between euthanasia and humane dispatch. Euthanasia is the animal is unconscious while it is dying. Humane dispatch is a rapid killing of the animal, but the animal is still conscious. And that's an important distinction for those of us as professionals in this field. And you need to be, you need to have that burned into your neurons so that you make sure you're acting, uh, that you're discussing euthanasia and humane dispatch appropriately so that you don't reinforce mythology in the public. So alligators, uh, we don't have alligators, of course, in Montana, at least not yet. Uh, but for those of you in the those of you in the South who have alligators, it's I came across this particular article. Say, so how do I get onto subjects? Well, if I don't get ideas from you in the in the audience out there, I will come across articles and they'll maybe pique my interest, or I think, well, some some of my audience will be interested in that. And so we try to get a little geeky. So a lot of times I'll be getting into some nuances that aren't going to be necessarily covered by your standard run of the mill training uh, training events. So uh, this is kind of my niche. I'm getting into things that aren't just derived from personal experience, as important as that is. I'm getting into scientific literature of things that you're not going to necessarily learn on your own when you're climbing a ladder dealing with a particular wildlife problem. So it's not necessarily better, it's different, and it's important. Practical experience is important, but so isn't detailed scientific reflection. And so what this author and his co-authors were saying is multiple articles for this particular article was that there's very not a lot known about how to about the euthanasia of reptiles. And they drilled it down into alligators because there is an industry of alligator harvesting, both nat native alligators in the sense that they're out in the wild and uh, farming alligators. So we need to figure out ways of how to dispatch these animals responsibly and as humanely as possible. And some of you may be th rolling your eyes, oh, Stephen, what do we care? It's just an alligator. And I think it's important for us as wildlife control operators to recognize that you don't have to be an animal rights activist to care about animal suffering. Uh, I don't want any of you to be animal rights activists. I think that's a, a, a profoundly anti-environmental position, and I think it's one that devalues the eminence of humanity. And uh, I will never, I don't call humans animals. I don't believe humans are animals. We are ontologically different. Those of you who have a philosophical bent will know what that means, that there's something in us that animals don't have. So we may be, we may have analogous things with them. You know, we have biology, we're, we're bodily figures, but there is something that we have that animals don't have. And that's a barrier that's big as the Grand Canyon. Okay. Nevertheless, we need to have respect for the life of the animal that we're taking. And that means to try to kill them and dispatch them if we're deciding to kill them in a responsible manner that is to the extent practical. This is where I differ from the AVMA and other types of organizations as I believe there's an economic aspect to, to animal dispatch that if something is too expensive, it's just not going to work. It needs to be the animal's life is not worth millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? So obviously most euthanasia techniques don't involve millions and millions of dollars, but I'm trying to drive a point here. However, I do think that just because a technique costs a little bit more doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. So my rule of thumb has been if something is 10% more expensive, but better, we should do it. I think 10%, and I call it, it's my 10% rule. I just picked a number out of the head that I thought would be responsible 
for example, carbon carbon dioxide is more expensive than drowning an animal. But I think the additional cost is not an undue burden for those of us in the wildlife control industry. Now, I'm not looking to, to ban drowning. Drowning has its place. But all things being equal, if you have a choice between drowning the animal and, and using CO2, CO2 would be preferable, all things being equal. Now, if you're out in the middle of the woods somewhere, you're not going to be carrying your gas chamber around all over the place and drop it in the stream, right? I get that. And there may be situations where you want a drowning set so that the animal actually suffers less than waiting for you to come and then put it in the gas chamber. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. But I think my point is, is that we need to be thinking about it. If you're not thinking about this, then there, I would say that I would encourage you to start. And if you just don't care then I would say that's sort of a moral, a moral flaw in your character that you need to deal with. So just because we kill animals doesn't mean we hate them. We want to do it responsibly. We're not animal rights activists, at least I hope you're not. And we want, but we should show these animals respect. And if, and this type of research is important. So how can we as wildlife control operators dispatch these animals in a responsible manner and because sometimes you have two different techniques and they both take the same amount of work well we want to use the one that would cause less pain and suffering to the extent of our knowledge and that's why this is an evolving issue because as we learn more our techniques improve or change and get replaced by others so anyways this particular article was published by Navarez and his fellow authors this was published in 2014, and the title of the article is Evaluation of Four Methods for Inducing Death During Slaughter of American Alligators, Alligator Mississippiensis, AGVR, that's the abbreviation. I think it's the American Journal of Veterinary Review. A, a volume 75, edition uh, item 6, June pages 536 to 543. So let me read that again. Navarez et al. published in 2014. Title is Evaluation of Four Methods for Inducing Death During Slaughter of American Alligators, Alligator Mississippiensis, AGVR, Volume 75, Issue 6, June, pages 536 to 543. And the motivation, as I've already said, was that because of there's an industry with alligators and that there hasn't, a, hasn't been a lot known about how to properly kill reptiles. And the challenge that they were talking about was that we, it's difficult to assess the level of consciousness of reptiles, right? I mean, you can, you can probably do a mind meld, you know, with your dog, but how do you do that with a snake? How do you evaluate how alert and self-aware and experiencing pain or not pain when you're staring at a snake? And alligators, of course, are in the reptile, in the reptile family. So that is the challenge. And so they had to come up with a standard for how they were they going to determine does this is this alligator in pain? You say, well, why does it matter if it's in pain? Because if the animal is conscious it can experience pain. If the animal is not conscious, then it's not experiencing pain. And euthanasia is all about the suffering. In order to, be, in order to suffer, an organism must have consciousness and the sense of self-awareness. It must experience, it must experience the neurological symptoms of pain and or some sort of me emotional mental anxiety, okay? How do you do that with a reptile? Okay, so that's what this, these researchers were trying to determine to the best of their knowledge. So how did they do this? Well, they basically used four key signs to determine life and level of consciousness and awareness of the, of the alligator. They used heart rate, which certainly makes sense. If the animal's heart stops beating, it's going to die. An ECG, that is an encephalogram where they put nodes on the brain of the alligator and monitor its brain waves, right? So you've probably seen those in shows where they would stick things to people's heads to see if they're brain dead or not, right? Do they have higher order functioning or is there just their brain stem working, right? We have sort of what's called two brains. It's not 
don't think that's quite true, but for the sake of argument, let's just go with it. So you have your higher order brain, you know, where you're thinking consciously, and then you have the automatic brain, the brainstem that governs your breathing, right? You're not thinking about breathing, all right? Oh, I gotta take a breath now. No, it's just automatic. So that's your lower brain. So you could be, you could have a lack of mental functioning up here, but still be breathing. <clears throat> But are you suffering? And the answer would be no, because you don't have any self-awareness. Well, the same question is with these animals. So they're using an ECG. Then they also use the sign of spontaneous blinking, right? Dead animals don't blink. And then lastly, pain, whether it's superficial pain or deep pain. Those, that's how they evaluate it. So what did they do? Well, they had four different techniques to kill the animal, to kill the animals. Spinal severance, where they would cut the spine in half, usually at the neck. Spinal severance with pithing. Captive bolt penetrating and captive bolt non-penetrating. Those are the four methods they did. I know I got some spelling errors there. So what were their results? They found that when they just severed the spine of the alligator, the alligator still had brain function for over an hour afterwards. So you say, well, how would they know the animal had brain function? And how is that really relevant? Well, yeah, we don't have a lot of encephalograms on alligators. That's certainly true. But they were monitoring the alligators prior to their death and prior to their treatment to sort of get an idea of a baseline. And they found that certain brain waves were strong during when the animal was awake. Certain brain waves were, were strong when the animal was sort of resting. Certain brain waves were strong when the animal was sleeping. And then of course, when the lines are all flat, the animal had no brain waves at all. Is it perfect? No. How do you know the brain waves correlate with self-consciousness? This is the problem, right? We, it's an assumption. We assume that the brain waves are associated with levels of consciousness. Is it? Do, can we prove it? Not, not yet. Not, not, certainly not yet, but it's the best that we've got. The second, so they found that with just severing the spine, there, there was still brain activity up to an hour. And part of that is because these animals can tolerate very low levels of oxygenation. They can hold their breath a long time. So the brain can still be active even though the animal's not gonna be breathing, right? Because whatever oxygen's there, it's still doing its thing. Then they tried spinal severance with pithing. So pithing is when they would cut, they would cut the spine and then pithing is they would take their knife and sort of penetrate the brain itself. And what they found there was that that worked pretty well. The animals died quickly and the brain waves dropped off dramatically. They did have one instance where they believe that the, an error with the technician's method caused the animal to have consciousness for a little bit longer period of time. Part of that was, I guess, the delay in how quickly they pith. They were talking things like eight seconds, which is like, wow, pretty, they, they thought that was slow. So I'm like, eight seconds, that seemed fast to me. But I guess if I was a alligator and someone just severed my neck, I guess eight seconds of consciousness would probably be more than what I would want too. So it's hard, it's hard to determine. But what they said was that better training with the technicians would have probably improved that situation. And that's a good point to, for us to remember. And that is, it's mo we often focus on the method, but the method's only as good as the applicator, right? You can choose the best pesticide, but if you're applying it like crap, it ain't gonna work, at least not as well, as well as it should. Same way with euthanasia. If you're severing the spine and you don't get that knife into the brain, well then obviously you're not, that's not gonna be as good as it could have been for that particular animal, all right. They also tried captive bolt penetrating. This is where the rod actually penetrates the skull and they said the results of that were good or okay. Captive bolt non-penetrating this is just where it's a thump, but it doesn't break the skin or the skull, I guess I should say. Uh, they said was also okay, but I wanna point out that the AVMA in the 2020 edition of their euthanasia standards said that you should only use non-penetrating captive bolts 
for alligators between the weights of 11 to 33 pounds. So notice that the article that we are looking at here was published in 2014. So the AVMA published in 2020, they believe that there should have been, that you should only use it for the smaller alligators because otherwise you're just sort of knocking the animal out and or giving it a pretty hard headache. So there you go. So that's important information for us to know, but then I wanted to point out to you the, a, a piece of literature from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, how they deal with how to dispatch uh, alligators. And they talk about bang stick placement, and so they suggest that you secure the alligator against the side of the boat, you'd wanna make sure that the animal's head is below the water level, and then you hit it with a bang stick. Notice where it's placed. It's placed just at the base of the skull, away from the skull. You're not going through the skull, you're going underneath the skull, pointing that toward the brain. So it's in that rough area of the animal's head, angled slightly toward the nose. And then you're sort of severing the, hitting the brain and probably severing the spinal cord, probably all, all at once, something like that, probably. And that's basically it. And now why are you doing it below water? Well, the reason you're doing it below water is there's sometimes there may be pieces that, that kind of come off the animal or the shell perhaps, and you want to be sure that the water helps slow the momentum and velocity of that material if it so it does avoids injuring you. Okay, that's why you're doing it below the water. And that's what the South Carolina DNR in their manual says. Now notice that that's different from what they said. It, what They have two publications and there's a difference between them. Notice that their publication in 2011 said, don't shoot between the eyes and don't shoot at the top of the skull because they said there's a possibility of ricochet. In their 2022 publication, they reiterate the placement of the bang stick at the base of the skull, but they don't mention prohibitions on shooting between the eyes or the top of the skull, which is interesting. But notice their publication came after the AVMA guidelines. So perhaps they softened the language there out of deference to the AVMA guidelines. What they do state, however, is that improper placement of whether you're shooting with a gun or whether you're using a bang stick, that if you don't place it properly, the animal may only be unconscious and not dead. And of course, unconscious means you can become conscious later on, and that can be and often at the worst possible time. So you need to be very, very careful, make sure these animals are dead. Now, why is all this, this important? Well, here's why. The AVMA says you're supposed to shoot the in, you shoot the alligator in the head right there. Now notice how this particular location is fundamentally different from the recommendation of the South Carolina DNR in their 2011 publication, which they changed or modified slightly in their 2022 publication. Those of you who are just listening, uh, you probably want to just sort of read this, get onto a computer, or look it up in your eye, on your phone, where you can read this these differences. So the AVMA says shoot right through the skull, just above the eyes, straight down, to take out that brain. Okay, but remember, so why the difference here? Well, I suspect, and again, I'm I'm offering a speculation here, an opinion that the South Carolina DNR is interested in, in how these animals are to be killed in the field where the conditions aren't perfect. It's not like a doctor's, a veterinarian's office, right? Where you have all the equipment you need, the weather, you're not swatting mosquitoes, you're not worried about capsizing the boat, you're in very controlled conditions and you can then make the placement really, really well. Additionally, the DNR is probably concerned about 
what is the risk of a ricochet through the skull? If you're shooting it through the skull, is there, how big is the risk? And is it better to have the animal suffer a little bit if it's going to be safer for the applicator? Now, I, I don't have evidence of all this yet. I'm just sort of trying to speculate as to why there's a difference in wording and attention between the South Carolina document and the AVMA document. Now, part of it, of course, is level of precision. But part of it has to be, in my opinion, it's just hard for me to imagine otherwise that the South Carolina folks know how to capture alligators. They're able to talk to people that have done a lot. And perhaps it's just a little too risky for them to say, hey, shoot it here all the time. So they basically, in my opinion, they probably soft pedaled it in deference to the AVMA, but uh, didn't go as so far as to say, do just what the AVMA says. I'd love to have your feedback on that. You can send me your comments either on the face, Facebook group site where we are on the pesky group, or you can drop me an email at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts, particularly those of you who deal with uh, alligators. Whatever method you use to dispatch your alligator, make sure you never assume the alligator is dead unless it's really dead, okay? And uncon animals can go unconscious. These alligators, you can hit them with certain things and they may not be as dead as you think they are. And if they wake up, things can go bad. This is why the South Carolina document tells you, you need to be sure you have that mouth secured before you're lifting that animal into the boat, okay? So you have it restrained, you hit it with your bang stick or you hit it with your gun, whatever the case may be, you're at the base of the skull angled forward. You're gonna, the animal's gonna thrash around probably a little bit for some neurological response. It's gonna be restrained and when things calm down, you're gonna tape up that mouth and then you're gonna lift it into the boat because you wanna make sure that he ain't going to be able to bite you. And there may be some other restraining techniques you probably need to put in there as well. Then it's recommended by the AVMA then is that you at least sever the spine. And I suspect this is by, if not the AVMA, then at least by the South Carolina folks. So if you shoot, if you're, if you're shooting, then make sure you're taking that spine out. And then uh, what, do, what do you need? Like a four inch, four inch drop point blade can work. So it's sort of like a little extra, it's sort of like when an animal is unconscious and you know it's unconscious and you're like, I wanna make sure it's really dead and you maybe do a thoracic compression. There you go. That would be a secondary, uh, secondary dispatch method, okay? Just to make sure it's really dead. And that's not probably not a bad idea uh, to do it, right? Just use that four inch drop point blade right at the base of the skull. Well, I hope you found that interesting. If not necessarily it's something for your business, I know it's a pretty niche area, but we're gonna deal with those types of things in the Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we're, we're geeky here. And so we're gonna get into some areas where you're not necessarily gonna be discussing some of these topics in the typical training event. Typically in wildlife control, you're getting training, just how are you gonna make money? How are you gonna just bang, 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 solve the problem? Well. There are a lot of people out there doing that sort of training. I do some of that training as well. But I want to take you to places where the average individual is not going to be able to learn these things on their own. We're going to explore the, the literature, the scientific literature, to give you some background so that you can talk intelligently about alligator dispatch and euthanasia. And understand that this is an evolving area and that we're going to be learning more in the future about this as more and more researchers spend time exploring this particular question. I do hope it'll help you euthanize or dispatch alligators more responsibly. Perhaps you've already been doing that, but at least you have an understanding of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and why the recommendations have sort of changed slightly over the years. And I would suspect probably when the next AVMA guidelines come out in 20, probably 2027, we'll see another change, maybe ever so slight. 
but there may be other recommendations. And so gives you food for thought. Well, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, and give us a five-star review. Join us on Facebook with our group, the Pest Geek Podcast family on uh, Facebook, and we'd love to see you there. And, of course, I would love to hear from you if you have comments, suggestions for shows, topics. Yes, even criticisms. You can reach me at Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. And those of you who have, I'm sure many of you out there have large uh, photo libraries that you need to get organized. If you'd like to have hire someone to get those photos organized for you so that you can then find them in the future, uh, definitely check me out. We can discuss terms on getting your uh, important photos organized because that's a valuable part of your particular company and marketing for your firm as well. So definitely reach out to me. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.